Thanks, Dr. Dazeel and Dr. Mezla for inviting me to speak today. Uh, my module will be on preoperative uh, considerations um, and assessment and things to think about specifically when you're taking a patient to the operating room for a cholecystectomy, um, conditions and diseases that need to be considered uh, prior to your operation. So the key principle is safety first. When you're taking a patient in the operating room, you want to be prepared for the possibility of a difficult gallbladder. And this is done by reviewing the patient's acute and chronic comorbid conditions, by identifying any potential red flags during your workup with the patient, and considering other factors like obesity, prior surgery, and pregnancy. It's important to know when to operate and when not to operate. And it's just as important to know what the non-operative management options are when appropriate. So the preoperative pre algorithm can be summarized uh, in four sections, which we'll review today. Uh, you need to review the suspected indication for cholecystectomy based on the patient's history, exam, um, and any medical investigations. Assess for any possible medical contraindications, such as a high ASA class or pregnancy. Assess for red flags or more extensive hepatobiliary disease uh, as listed there, such as acute cholecystitis, myritzes, portal hypertension, jaundice, or suspicion of malignancy. And finally, assessing for other technical factors uh, such as obesity, pregnancy, and previous operations. For the purposes of this module, we'll be focusing mainly on these um, items that are in orange and more specifically on ways to safely manage patients with these um, two blocks of conditions. So in a typical patient uh, presenting with acute cholecystitis, as many of us know, they come in with acute right upper quadrant abdominal pain that can radiate uh, across the upper abdomen as well as to the back. They may have fever or positive Murphy sign. Um, and here's an image of a distended gallbladder with a thickened uh, wall. Labs may uh, include an increased white blood cell count, as well as the potential for increased liver function tests. And the ultrasound is the gold standard imaging technique, which demonstrates, as on this image, gallbladder wall thickening, pericholecystic fluid, distension, and potentially a sonographic Murphy sign. The risk factors that indicate the potential for a difficult cholecystectomy um, have been published uh, in different studies, and they include uh, greater than 72 hours of symptoms, an increased white blood cell count above 18 K, palpable gallbladder, increased age and comorbidities, as well as a suspected uh, gangrenous gallbladder, as you can see in the image. In patients who present with symptoms greater than 72 hours, one consideration, because the uh, operation could be high risk, is to perform non-operative management by decompressing the gallbladder percutaneously with a cholecystostomy tube, often performed by interventional radiology, allowing the acute inflammatory process to subside, uh, and then coming back later on for an interval cholecystectomy. Moving on to Maritzi syndrome, the definition of Maritzi's is compression of the common hepatic duct by a large stone impacted in the gallbladder neck or cystic duct. And this may or may not be accompanied by a cholecystobiliary fistula. And the different types um, are displayed here. The diagnosis of Maritzi's requires an increased clinical suspicion. Um, symptoms can mimic acute cholecystitis and the patient can have fevers, chills, and other signs of infection. Jaundice is also possible. On labs, uh, there may be an increased white blood cell count as well as abnormal LFTs. And so imaging um, should be performed, which include an ultrasound, CT scan, or MRI, which would often indicate a large stone impacted in the duct as well as a dilated uh, common hepatic duct. Uh, because there is often severe inflammation um, and very often difficult operative conditions, these cases often require hepatobiliary expertise. Um, Preoperatively, a CT scan can be performed to help rule out malignancy. And one should consider the use of cholangiography or ERCP to help determine the presence of a fistula 
What's nice about an ERCP is that it's not only diagnostic, but it's therapeutic as well, um, where you can perform a sphincterotomy or stenting as needed. In patients with <clears throat> cirrhosis or portal hypertension, these patients often have evidence of disease um, on exam or imaging, uh, which include right upper quadrant pain, bleeding, ascites, symptoms of biliary stasis, intermittent colic, cholangitis, or these patients can be completely asymptomatic. So with regards to labs, there's a panel of labs that should be drawn, um, and these include liver function tests, a COAG panel, renal function testing, a viral hepatitis panel, as well as determining levels of hepatotoxic agents such as acetaminophen um, if these are of concern. On imaging, uh, ultrasound and CT scan are usually very helpful as they will demonstrate uh, cirrhosis, varices, or ascites. Um, the MRCP is also important for evaluating the biliary tree for stones, strictures, and any other pathology. Uh, moving on to patients um, with portal hypertension, oftentimes you will um, be at risk uh, with dilated vasculature um, that you can see here on both the CT scan and once you're in the operating room. So you really want to weigh um, the risks and benefits of proceeding with the operation um, and call in for additional uh, expertise as needed. It's important to note that acute hepatitis or cirrhosis can mimic the symptoms of cholecystitis or biliary colic, um, and so one needs to consider these um, as these would be uh, non-operative in nature. But acute cholecystitis is common in this population, should be carefully evaluated or ruled out. Because the operation may involve considerable risk, a patient's um, child's class or MELD score should be determined preoperatively. Um, they are at risk for um, liver failure, and so you want to optimize their liver function, correct any thrombocytopenia or coagulopathy, uh, and preemptively send a type and screen for these cases. A CT scan, as stated earlier, can identify potential varices. And again, consider expert consultation or transfer to a tertiary care center um, as required. Uh, onto the suspicion of malignancy. Um, in patients who have unexplained pancreatic biliary obstruction, fistula, weight loss, or mass on imaging, the suspicion of malignancy must enter your mind. These patients can have painful or painless jaundice with or without the signs of infection. Uh, if they have biliary obstruction, they may have increased the LFTs. With regards to the topic of polyps, um, many times patients do present with um, gallbladder polyps or a mass on imaging. As long as they're less than 10 millimeters, these usually can be followed with serial ultrasounds. Unless they become symptomatic, you identify presence of blood flow, there's evidence of invasion into the liver bed, the patient has a porcelain gallbladder, or if they're at high risk um, for hepatobiliary cancers. With regards to suspicion of malignancy overall, imaging can demonstrate gallstones with or without dilated ducts or a solid mass um, or asymmetric wall thickening. So these are all red flags to look for. If a patient is jaundiced, you have to determine uh, the cause of the jaundice and rule out malignancy. A CT or MRI um, is probably best to delineate the hepatobiliary anatomy. And in high-risk operations, oftentimes this will require an open operation, um, and again, consideration of surgical management by an uh, HPV um, expert. In some cases, in order to complete your workout, uh, I'm sorry, work up um, preoperatively, uh, you may need to delay the cholecystectomy, and so in these cases, you want to consider biliary decompression with an ERCP um, and or antibiotic therapy as needed. Uh, we, I put in this uh, slide on pulmonary hypertension because in these patients, they often can have uh, imaging findings that 
make it seem as if they have cholecystitis, but really it's due to um, the pulmonary hypertension or um, heart failure. And so as you can see here, you can have imaging that shows no stones but diffuse wall thickening or large caliber hepatic veins in the IVC. So if a patient has a history of pulmonary hypertension or heart failure but no real symptoms, it may just be that um, they have these as due to their systemic illness and not to a gallbladder problem. Uh, in the absence of uh, infection or biliary obstruction, these symptoms should then resolve over time with management of the medical disease. And you do not want to operate on these patients, obviously. With regards to pregnancy, as with the SAGES guidelines, um, which you can review uh, separately, a lap coli um, is safe in any trimester, and in fact, a delay in treatment leads to additional morbidity and mortality. Um, with varying levels of evidence, safe imaging techniques include ultrasound, MR without contrast, intraoperative cholangiogra uh, cholangiography with shielding, and nuclear imaging studies. The decision to operate um, should then be based on clinical judgment and obviously discussion with the patient and their uh, obstetrician. So the conclusion of this algorithm, the ultimate question is, does the patient need to go to the operating room? If the answer is yes, then you would proceed with a laparoscopic cholecystectomy or in difficult cases, consider open approach. If the answer is no, this may be due to the fact that the patient has no gallbladder pathology, and so you would just stop there. Um, but the other reason why you may not take a patient immediately to the operating room is because you need to optimize their condition, allow time um, to cool off the gallbladder, or um, buy yourself time for further workup. And in these cases, it's important to know that you do have non-operative management options, which include antibiotics, percutaneous cholecystostomy tube, and decompression of the biliary tree with ERCP or percutaneous uh, cholangiography. Thank you.